The other day, I was talking to myself again about operating systems, like if I didn't do that for the past two years, and I noticed something interesting. I've daily driven all popular operating systems, iOS, Android, Windows, and Linux, but there was one that I hadn't used until now, macOS. Let's explore it. To support the channel, you can like, subscribe, donate, or leave a comment. I always hoard them. Thank you. You might be asking why I never used macOS, and that's a pretty simple answer. It's not because I personally avoided it or something like that, I just never really had the chance to use it. You can install Windows and Android on anything, most of their corresponding devices already run them. You can also install Linux on anything, but iOS and macOS are a special case, because you can only use them with Apple's hardware, that is, to use iOS, you need to buy an iPhone, and to use macOS, you have to buy a Mac. Some years ago, I daily drove an iPhone SE of the first generation for a couple of years, but I've never had a Mac. If iPhones are expensive, Macs are usually way more expensive. I never really had the money to buy one. I did propose myself some years ago to buy a Mac, but I ended up opting for a PC instead as I wanted to play games. Mac OS is always an operating system that has been so intriguing to me, and more now having learned about Linux, knowing that a lot of these things apply to Mac OS too, because they're both Unix-like systems. The whole video will be from my perspective as a Linux user that runs stock Fedora with GNOME, and for my phone, I run Graphene OS, which is a pretty bare bones experience. This is going to be a long and very in-depth video just as a warning, and some complaints will be very similar to Nix's macOS review from the Linux experiment, and I think you should watch his video. In fact, while I was recording this video, he just uploaded a more recent review about macOS, but also included the hardware. This is a pretty interesting coincidence, so go and watch that one too. So, I managed to run a copy of the latest Mac OS 13, Ventura, and I tried it for a lot of days, trying to replicate stuff that I usually do on other operating systems. This was my experience and is my opinion of the OS as a whole. Keep in mind that I'm a newbie in this and that there might be a lot of things that I don't know or I get wrong, so feel free to correct me in the comments. Let's begin with the installation process. It's honestly very straightforward. You just format a drive that you want to install macOS on, choose it, and it will guide you through the setup. Choosing stuff like the country, your username, picture, and password. A very good installation experience. Some Linux distros also have a great installation experience comparable to this one, mainly vanilla OS. Also, extra points for not forcing an Apple ID. If you want the whole Apple ecosystem thing, you'll need it, but macOS is a little more open than you would probably expect user interface. Now, with UI, I mainly mean the design. The user experience will be a whole separate section. I have to admit that macOS and iOS have one of the most consistent GUIs I've ever seen. You don't really see a lot of sections that are outdated, and even though it is not perfect and no UI designed by a human will ever be completely consistent, it still looks more consistent than Android and Linux in some parts, and let's not even talk about Windows, everything beats its non-existent consistency. I like the rounded look of buttons, checkboxes, and switches. They are not fully flat, and you can notice that they have a slight shading that gives them more depth. I really like that lists, like the one you see in the Finder, have this 
black and white or grey monotone look. It's a subtle way of telling you where an item starts and ends and looks pretty fancy. If I had a word to describe the whole design, it would be that. Fancy. Since macOS Big Sur, icons have been redesigned from their previous flat appearance. Some people call this new style neomorphism, which is a combination of the previous flat and ischiomorphic design that previous macOS versions had. I honestly think this is the best design macOS has had. I'm sorry, but that's just my opinion. <laughs> it just combines the legibility and contrast of the flat style and tries to make it less boring by adding depth with lights, shadows, and textures. Most of the app icons seem to have been updated to this new iOS-ish rounded square look, even third-party apps. I honestly don't mind it too much, but for some people, it can look a little more like a phone OS. The dock is now a little more rounded and it floats, having a margin between all your screen sides. I I think it looks pretty. The menu bar is something I personally didn't find myself using, like in 80% of the times, but it also looks fancy to me with that Apple logo and good solid and monochrome icons for the system tray. Think that all other OSs don't do that well, with often inconsistent icons and it really bothers me. <laughs> the quick settings menu is cool, obviously adapted from iOS, which for some people could mean more clicks to do something simple, but you can add shortcuts to these settings to the menu bar, so it's not an issue at all. I actually wish GNOME had something like this by default. The animations are really cool and smooth. I love the genie lamp animation when minimizing windows or the apps that bounce when they're loading. Unfortunately, those are the main animations you'll notice because some other things like spotlight or closing windows are not animated, probably because these actions have to be quick, but I think that a simple fade animation would help. Let's talk about my favorite part about the macOS UI, starting with the cursor. I don't know if it's just me, but I think this is the best prettiest cursor I've seen on any OS and interface. The default black and white look is simple and helps with the contrast. The Mickey Mouse-like hand cursor emulating a globe looks fancy again. The rainbow loading cursor is funny and creative, and I really appreciate this shake to find cursor feature. It looks a lot like the Gnome Athweta cursor, which is my second favorite one, but there is something about the macOS cursor that I just think it, it looks better, like easier to find. And I think it's probably the thicker white border and slightly more opaque drop shadows compared to the Athweta one. But well, only nerds care about these things. <laughs> I wouldn't blame you if you don't even notice the difference, but if you're watching this deep dive so far, you're very likely a nerd too. My favorite UI detail about macOS are these three dots. They're just so pretty, so simple and easy to understand. They also have a consistent shape, thing that I really hate that is not the case in Windows. In Windows, sometimes the window controls are larger or they have a hitbox that is not consistent with the other ones. I, I just don't know how they get that wrong. I, I honestly don't know. <laughs> They took the concept of the traffic lights that we as humans are used to, which makes it instantly recognizable. If there is one detail that I was very curious about the first time I looked at macOS, it was this, the traffic lights. You know that red is a destructive or dangerous action. The yellow button is also an important action but not destructive and that the green button is a non-destructive action. 
By default, no icons are shown to explain the traffic lights, but I don't think they're that necessary, as once you hover your mouse over them, they display what they do. When you have unsaved work, or you're running a command, the close button has this little circle inside of it as an indication of this. I didn't know this, and I like this detail. If I had any complaint about their design, it would be that they probably should be bigger. Every OS should adapt a design like this. It's so good. GNOME has something similar to this, but I would personally prefer something a bit more colorful, like this. And I don't think I'm the only one that loves these things, because I saw them always in Unix porn. A lot of apps like the Finder have a clear distinction between the solid and blurred parts. I really like this design, I think that is also seen in iOS and Windows. You can also customize your accent color, which will tint the controls you see in every app, and the dark and light theme. Windows gets this wrong, as only the new Windows 11 apps support this. Android gets this perfectly, with almost all parts of the system and even third-party apps being tinted. GNOME does not have this yet. Probably we're going to get it for the next release, but other Linux desktop environments seem to have it. I don't know why iOS doesn't though, it's really weird. Like, they let you customize your lock screen, but they don't really let you choose the accent color. Well, the wallpapers are really cool, but I'm not going to talk about them so much. I personally preferred back when they were pictures of real locations, but I guess it's easier, cheaper, and less risky to make abstract wallpapers. In macOS, all windows are slightly rounded, which gives them a prettier look, in my opinion. Windows 11 also has this, but I think Chrome OS does not. GNOME kinda does this, but not so well. Only live Weta apps seem to have consistent rounded corners. All other apps do have them, but only in the title bar. This looks inconsistent to me, and I wish GNOME did this at the compositor level for all apps. macOS title bars are usually very slim, with a center title in bold and an icon next to the title. I really like this design better than the Windows one, where titles are aligned to the left, and most of the times the title bar isn't even adapted to your theme, leaving an ugly white background for no reason. GNOME does this very similarly to macOS, but the title bars tend to be bigger in some cases, when in reality there is not a lot of reason for them to be this huge. And I mean in some cases, because most Live at Weta or GNOME apps save space by adding widgets like search bars or buttons to the title bar taking advantage of all the space, which I have no complaints about, and I think it's a good way of solving this. And some apps like the Finder, macOS does have even bigger title bars compared to GNOME, and it doesn't seem to have a lot of sense why you would do this. Now let's move on to the part where I'm going to get dislikes for, the user experience. <laughs> I've praised the design of macOS, but in terms of user experience, I think there is a lot of room for improvement. Some things are inferior, and in other cases, it's just awful. Let's begin with the window management. My first complaint is that dragging a window to a corner to snap is not a thing. This has been the case for years in almost any other operating system. Windows, GNOME, KDE, and even freaking Chrome OS has this. Now, I know that snapping is a thing, but you have to long press the green button that shows a menu, letting you snap it to either side. But it's more cumbersome than it should ever be. And most people never find about this. Quarter tiling isn't a thing either. To be fair, GNOME does not have that, and back when I used Windows, I barely used quarter tiling, but I still think both macOS and GNOME should have it. 
I know you can use rectangle or magnet to solve this, but I don't think you should have to download or even buy in some cases a third party app to fix such an important flaw with the OS. Fair enough, GNOME also lacks some features that I personally don't use, like the system tray or desktop icons, and you can get them back by installing an extension, which may seem hypocritical considering what I just said, but at least GNOME extensions are free as in price, and I have yet to see a closed source extension, but in this case, yeah, I will not make an exception, and I still think that GNOME should should include these things by default, even if I don't use them. The worst thing about macOS window management is that clicking the red button doesn't really close an app, it closes the window. It's fine for most things, unless you have one window, which is becoming more common, due to apps with tabs, like a browser. I know that I said the traffic lights looked good, but that's it, they look good, they don't work that good. <laughs> It's not even consistent. Some apps like the Finder will not get closed if you close all of its windows with the red button. But if you try the same thing with the App Store, it does get closed. I think this is a very outdated approach and I'm not the only one confused by this. Everyone I met got confused with this behavior. It just doesn't make any sense. And the close button not being consistent makes it worse. I don't want to play guessing whether an app I closed with the red button is actually closed or if it's just hidden, running in the background and wasting resources. And if I'm confused by that, just imagine the average user that switched from Windows or any other OS where this is not a thing. I know that I can get a consistent behavior quitting all apps by pressing Command Q, but that is never explained and it's not a real solution to a problem that Apple just invented themselves. The green button is also not consistent. Most people get confused when they first use it because they expect a window to be maximized like in any other OS, but instead, most of the times it goes into full screen mode. This puts the current window into another virtual desktop and hides the menu bar and dock, showing them whenever you hover near them. Even if this is not the behavior most people want, it's very close to that. The issue is that it's not even consistent. Again, some apps like the Finder can be put into full screen mode. Other apps like the Settings app can't be put into this full screen mode, opting instead for the second thing the green button can do, that it's the zoom feature. This is what, in some cases, would give you the classic maximizing feature, making a window as big as possible but without overlapping itself with the menu bar and dock. But even then, it's pretty bad. To toggle between full screen and zoom, you have to keep the option key pressed, or you have to double click the title bar, which again is never explained. In some cases, zooming an app doesn't even maximize them, which is why I said that it's a similar feature that in some cases works like maximizing, but it's not truly that. Instead, it is switching the current window between the previous two saved sizes. Yes, in most cases, it means maximizing, but not in all cases, like in the settings app. For some reason, you cannot make the app full screen, but you cannot fully maximize it either. Yet, the green button is still there and performs the zooming operation, which switches between the current window size and a slightly bigger window size. This doesn't make any sense at all. It's a completely useless feature and makes me wonder why just not remove the green button for this app in the first place if the settings app can't be maximized or made full screen or why Apple, a trillion dollar company, can't make a settings app that can be maximized. Uh, fortunately, the yellow button does minimize the selected window, but all minimized windows are hidden as a preview in a separate section of the dock. 
instead of being merged with the icon of the app that is very likely in your dock already. To me, this is a waste of space and it's confusing. I do like the downloads folder and the trash shortcuts in the dock though. In macOS Monterey, there was this new window management feature called Stage Manager, which basically makes these window previews larger and puts them to your left side. It's cool, but I don't think anyone really uses it. Again, Apple just solving a problem they themselves created that just takes unnecessary space. Speaking about wasted space, I think that the dock and menu bar are just a waste of space. Sure, they look really pretty, but in practice there is just no reason to have two big bars on your screen. It would be better if the dock defloated whenever you opened an app, like in the new KD Plasma's floating menu at least. And to be honest, the menu bar is kinda useless. Less and less programs use the classic menu paradigm. The only the apps I can think of are professional programs like Adobe programs, but even still, Microsoft has already replaced the menu bar with a ribbon, and more modern apps don't really use it. Sure, the menu bar does not only have a menu inside of it, but also the clock, system tray, and shortcuts for widgets, notifications, and that stuff, making it a little less useless. But I still think that all of this is redundant. To me, it just makes way more sense to have the opened apps, clock, and system tray all in one menu, like the taskbar paradigm. You might say that GNOME also has a top bar and a dock, and that's true, but the reason why I think it works in GNOME is because even if the dash is huge, 90% of the time it is hidden, you're not going to see it. The top bar is more useless compared to its macOS counterpart because there is no menu here. I would honestly like the option to auto hide it by default, you only need it to be there always to see the time. Being able to customize the top bar adding some widgets to it would also be great. And I know that it's a little bit harder to put a menu inside of the GNOME top bar because most GNOME applications don't use a menu anymore either way. So to me it's either a taskbar or a dock and top bar but that auto hide. I know that you can auto hide these things in macOS but it's not the default behavior. I never found any feature in macOS to make apps always stay on top. Fair enough, I think this is a Linux exclusive feature, but it shouldn't be. I really don't know why other OSs don't copy this useful feature. I think Windows also has it, but with power toys, but it should come with the stock OS, come on. Another feature that seems to be Linux exclusive is to be able to move and resize a window without having to necessarily click on the title bar, just by keeping the super key pressed and dragging to move or pressing the super key and middle clicking to resize a window from anywhere without having to aim for the small hitbox of the window corner. The launch pad exists. It's not really like a great app launcher, but it does the job. It does confuse me how huge the icons are though. You might say that it's because it's trying to be touch friendly, but there are no touchscreen Macs. Gnome also has a similar launcher, but I think it's better because of something we'll mention later. Plus, the icons being huge here, it's slightly more justified because GNOME is not only for desktops, but also for phones and touchscreen laptops. Also, by default, macOS comes with inverted scrolling. They call it natural scrolling. Everyone I met hates this. Chrome OS has it too, and it's one of the first things I disable. <laughs> Another awful point for macOS is the file management. 
I've seen a lot of people complaining about the Finder and also the window management online, but some Apple fanatics just deny everything and will never admit that it sucks a lot, let's be real. First, by default, there's no shortcut to your home, pictures, videos, and music folders. Why is this a thing? Who knows? Probably because Apple thought it was too complex for the mind of its users. That's honestly just disrespectful. You have to add them back manually in a setting, bury it in your menu bar. By default, you just have the downloads and documents folder as well as some shortcuts for your disks. When you clone a GitHub repo or download something from the terminal, the default location is your home directory. Just imagine a user cloning something and they can't find it in the ironically called Finder because there is no shortcut to their home directory? Well, you might say that you can just use the shortcut to your downloads directory and just go up one level, right? Well, you're wrong. In the Finder, there is no one level up button, just back and forwards buttons, which in some cases does bring you to one directory above, but not always. Again, GNOME does not have an up button, but I think actually their implementation is smarter. The path bar is clickable, so you can go up multiple directories with just a single click, instead of clicking the up button multiple times. In macOS, to do this, you have to keep the title bar pressed, and you'll get a similar menu, just smaller, hidden, and it's not well organized. And again, this is never explained. The finder, by default, does not show a path bar. You have to enable it from the settings, and if you want the full path to always be displayed as the title of the window, you have to run a command to do so. Interesting that Linux always has this bad reputation of having to tweak with the command line, when in macOS, you sometimes also have to do this for very basic stuff. Also, to go to a specific path, because there is no path bar, and even if you enable it, you cannot specify a location, you have to do another hidden keyboard shortcut that brings the go to dialog and that will bring you to wherever you want to go, but again, that is never explained. Another controversial thing that the Finder does not have is a cut file feature. I know that debate, you shouldn't be copying files because it's destructive and dangerous, and but if the user wants to do that, I think they should be able to do so, or at least do it the Apple way and show a safe dialog to where we want to move the file to, that would remove the risk, or just don't remove the file until it is pasted. Of course, there is no option to create an empty file from the Finder. I know GNOME does not have this by default at least, but it is possible and way more flexible thanks to the templates folder. Just not all distros have this folder with presets by default. There is also no option to open the current location in the terminal. Nautilus, the GNOME file browser, does have this. You cannot create hidden files by default from the Finder, and you cannot see them easily either. The option is there, but again, hidden away. Now, I have to talk about the few things that I do like about the Finder, starting with press space to preview a file. It's great. GNOME also has that, but I don't think Windows does by default. The column view is definitely the best Finder feature, and I'm jealous that it seems like no other file browser has this cool view. It's very intuitive in my opinion. Still, I think that the Finder is one of the worst file browsers out there, being the worst thing that I think you cannot replace it. The Finder goes into hand-to-hand -hand combat with the Chrome OS file browser to see which one is worse. <laughs> And I understand that the Chrome OS File Explorer is bad because you're not supposed to use local storage that much, you're expected to be using Google Drive instead. At least, I think the Finder had tabs like 
10 years before Microsoft implemented them, and it has a cool icon, which it's something. Speaking about the macOS workflow, uh, yeah, it's not that good. It could be great, but it's just not for some reason. I think GNOME does everything better than macOS, at least in terms of workflow. GNOME, it's like if Android and macOS had a child that had a proper workflow. I have to admit that at first, I didn't get used to the GNOME workflow, but I've been using it for more than 6 months now and it's just so natural when I go back to any other taskbar focused workflow I do feel like I am not as productive everything is just one super key away to see a preview of all your windows super key virtual desktops super key search super key same goes for the applications list and the dash it's just genius like if they took all the potentially good features of mac os and made them make sense and work together to the point where a minimize and maximize button don't make a lot of sense if there is one thing that gnome does not do as good as mac os does it's the search function Spotlight is just the best search on any OS. GNOME is not so behind though, letting you do calculations, launch apps, copy emojis and search files quickly even if they're on another drive. They're both way ahead of Windows Search, but I mean everything is better than that thing. <laughs> Let's talk about installing apps. The official and recommended method is to install them via the App Store. To be honest, I was expecting way more of this, knowing that it's Apple we're talking about. But there are no Adobe apps in the App Store or very popular apps like Steam or Firefox. It's so disappointing. This is clearly because of Apple's strict guidelines and because of the huge cut they make with App Store apps. You also forcefully need an account to download apps even if they're free. If a normal user does not find what they're looking for in the store, they will hunt for their software online, which is not really that much better than the awful Windows approach. Average users will get into malicious links and download fake stuff. Granted, most Windows viruses don't work on Mac, but if they look for the Mac version of a software, chances are that the scammer also has a special version for Mac. But once you find your third-party software, you have to download a DMG file. This is where a lot of people get confused. You're not supposed to open your app from the DMG file itself. You're supposed to open it and drag the app to the applications folder, which is not really that intuitive to me, keeping in mind that not all installers tell you that you have to do that. It's inconsistent and it's annoying if you want to download multiple apps. Also, sometimes you have to fight against macOS because it won't let you download external apps that easily. In Linux, I think we have the best experience. The closest to an app store but that actually has apps and doesn't even require you to use an account. In case of downloading multiple software, just click on install and it will be added to the download queue. Updates are also that painful. I know that Brew, a package manager for macOS, exists, and it's really great. You don't even have to give it super user permissions, but most people don't know about this, and even if they know about it, many will never try it because they're scared of the command line. The whole Apple ecosystem and synchronization is great, and that is if you don't care about Apple having your photos, mails, notes, contacts, location history, clipboard content, website history, and more. I know that these things are encrypted, but if I can avoid them, I will. I mean, it's not like I have an iPhone or other Apple products to begin with, and I wouldn't really switch back. If you prefer an open source alternative, you have KDE Connect, 
that does similar things but works on all OSs. But I mean, if you're using a Mac, you're probably also using an iPhone, so it wouldn't make a ton of sense. Finally, let's talk briefly about the default apps. They're very basic, but I would definitely consider some of them to be bloatware like the Apple TV, news, and music apps. I'm mixed about freeform, but probably someone will find it useful. Safari, it's fine, it's not the best browser out there, but I like the design and features, even though I've heard that web developers really hate it. I've never used widgets, Siri, nor desktop icons, and I think you shouldn't ever use the latter, to be honest. <laughs> The only reason why I used desktop icons was for urgent files and temporary files because I knew that it would piss me off to have those files on the desktop and I would just constantly check them and be sure to delete them. <laughs> Neither GNOME nor macOS nor Chrome OS seem to have a built-in clipboard manager. It's a shame, I think they all should have it. And uh, I think that's it. I will give you my conclusions. MacOS is a great looking operating system, but that leaves a lot to be desired in the UX department. It could be so great, but Apple refuses to give us a big update that gets rid of the annoyances, seemingly to still have differentiation from other OSs. MacOS would benefit a lot from a tutorial page, really. GNOME has that and explains you the most useful keyboard shortcuts. As a Unix-like system, it's a little bit disappointing if you come from Android, Linux, or any BSD, it is still quite locked down, but not nearly as iOS is, fortunately. If you have some terminal knowledge, you can tweak quite some things about the behavior and appearance, but don't expect being able to switch to another desktop environment or something like that. In terms of software and hardware availability, it's better than Linux, mainly in the proprietary department. If I bought an Apple Silicon Mac, I doubt I would daily drive macOS. I would very likely dual boot it with Asahi Linux to be able to use GNOME and even probably play some games, as the macOS game availability is a joke, and thanks to Apple. The whole summary would be great looking, but Apple holds it back. And if you were wondering, yes, sudo rmrf root works in macOS, and that's how we're ending this video. Thank you so much for watching, goodbye, see you in the next one, and apologies for the delay.